everyone. Nice to see you all here. It's, it's really exciting to see this meeting come to fruition. Uh, I don't think I could get much cooler than what's about to happen in the next three days. So I hope you're excited as well. I'm really, really excited and honored to introduce our first keynote speaker tonight. Um, I feel like he's sort of the man that needs no introduction. Uh, so I, it's really kind of uh, a little bit daunting to try to introduce Gene. I feel like you guys all know him. Does, is there anyone in this room that hasn't heard of Gene Robinson before? Please raise your hand. I, that's what I thought. <laughs> so, um, I mean, Gene, I think we would all agree is, is kind of the founding father of social insect genomics. And so um, he has been working on honeybees. Um, I was just talking to him tonight about um, his very first um, falling in love with honeybees in 1973. And um, he has been working on honeybees ever since and determined to know everything there is to know about honeybees. That's sort of his goal in life. And I think he's getting pretty close. <laughs> so um, his academic background um, stems actually from right here in, New in the state of New York. Um, he obtained his PhD from Cornell University in 1986, and um, he um, has been at the University of Illinois since um, 1989. So um, that's where I did my PhD in Gene's lab. Um, he is currently uh, has an endowed chair. He's the Swanland Chair and also director of the Institute for Genomic Biology at the University of Illinois, L Illinois and um, obviously the director of the Bee Research Facility. Um, he holds so many honors, it's kind of hard to know where to start, but um, he is a member of the National Academy of uh, Sciences and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has received um, numerous, um, very illustrious fellowships and awards. Um, and tonight, he is going to tell us about the latest and greatest um, of not just honeybee no genomics, but bee genomics. So without further ado, Gene. He asked permission before he, he did that. <laughs> We're good? Good. So, uh, oh yeah, that sounds much better. Yeah, it's great to be here. This is now the third meeting in this series. I want to thank Cold Spring Harbor and Dave Stewart especially uh, for, for his vision and, and allowing us to really launch this series. Back when we started it in 2007, I think we just had one genome to our name. And uh, as you heard from uh, Jurgen, we have uh, several more. So let me thank also the organizers, Amy, Jurgen, and, and, and uh, Guy, for their hard work and for inviting me. I'd like to start tonight with a little bit of a history lesson. And um, the purpose of the history lesson is to make a couple of points to set the stage uh, for my talk. I will admit, though, I'm doing it at a little risk to myself, and I'll mention that risk in a moment. But let me start with the history. This is a, an image from uh, E.O. Wilson's 1975 Sociobiology. And uh, the point of this image was to talk about, back in 1975, the imminent fragmenting of the field of behavioral biology. Uh, as uh, Wilson pointed out, uh, the field sort of coalesced in the 50s. And there was a rather indistinct barrier between mechanism and evolution at that time. Um, that, uh, that led to problems of, of levels of analysis, and that together with uh, the really great rise in cellular biology and fueling neuroscience, and also uh, great innovation in population biology, led to uh, an increasing fissioning in, the, in these areas, in these cognate areas, and E.O. Wilson predicted that by the year 2000, um, there would be essentially two separate fields um, going their, their separate way with very little overlap. This didn't uh, sit well with uh, many of us, and uh, we started to see some seeds of rapprochement in the early 1990s. Um, so there was an interest uh, increasingly in trying to see whether there could be some kind of a new synthesis that respected the hard-fought battles and, and insights 
to understand how to approach behavior from a levels of analysis and distinguish how and why type questions. All of you read Alcock or other animal behavior texts, you know what I'm talking about. And um, with Susan Farbach and Mark Winston, uh, I made this point here in this paper in 1997 that if we uh, were able to get to genes, we would be able to have a common language because, as the quote says, um, there's uh, a, a way for the genes to provide a common language because genes encode proteins that build the mechanistic basis, and then, of course, genes are the substrate upon which evolution acts, and so providing uh, information and a common language and, and mutual uh, connections across this divide. There was also uh, seeds of this happening in other areas. Um, for example, we, I cited here in this paper in 1997 that the classic textbook in behavioral ecology, uh, the most recent edition, the, the, it's a book that's renewed every few years. It's a, it's a classic, as I said. And um, Krebs and Davies, in the issue that came out, uh, the revision that came out in 1997, uh, for the first time had a chapter in mechanism. And so we started to see this happening. Uh, in 2005, Charlie Whitfield, Christina Grosinger, and I published this paper in uh, Nature Reviews Genetics that kind of was a manifesto for sociogenomics, pointing out that in the sort of subset of, of the field of social behavior, that a focus that brings genomics into the picture um, could, could really affect this, um, this synthesis. And I think the meeting is a testament to that, we are going to hear uh, talks that span the range of levels of analysis um, relating to brain and behavior. And we see the beginnings of a synthesis that allows people to go back uh, and forth and, and bring insights uh, as, as case may be. Um, so that's what I'm going to do in my talk, for sure. I also want to say that um, social insect biologists are really leading this, this synthesis, and there are a couple of reasons, and I think it's good to reflect upon that as we launch the meeting. First of all, we, and I don't need to tell you this, but we have a very rich organismal biology, and by that I mean the species uh, have rich organismal biology, and we as scientists are very interested in our organisms in totality. Even if we have a deep passion for neuroscience or population genetics, usually social insect biologists have a great appreciation for the whole organism. And this certainly helps us go back and forth between mechanism and evolution. We have multiple study systems, uh, both within and across species, allowing for the application of the classic comparative approach in very productive ways. The community as a whole, uh, we moved early and strongly into genomics. Um, this was the count that I had. Jurgen, maybe you have to correct me if I'm missing um, some, but this is what I saw most recently. Nine ants, ten bees, two termites, and two wasps in, in progress. And I hope to be corrected and, and be told that I'm really low in, in something. Nothing would make me happier. So um, we really have uh, the substrate upon which to use genomics to, to build a synthesis. So I mentioned that I gave this little history lesson as, uh, as at, at some risk to myself. Um, so the risk was, in about the year 2000, uh, we at Illinois had a, a search open in animal behavior, and I was on the search committee. And so I came to the meeting armed for bear uh, to argue for this integrative approach and that we really needed someone who could go across and, and integrate mechanism and evolution. And I launched into it, and the other folks who are on the, uh, on the committee looked at me and said, well, what else would you do? Of course we do that. And I uh, say that because I imagine many of you, especially younger folks, don't even appreciate the nature of the divide and just have come of age in a great uh, time of integrative approaches to animal behavior. This is also a way that I can tell you that if some of my generational jokes fall flat, for those of you that are younger, you will forgive me. So with that as, uh, as the introduction, uh, here's the outline for my talk. It's going to be in four parts. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about genomic signatures of eusocial evolution, a paper that we just heard yesterday uh, was accepted uh, at Science that deals with 10B genomes. And many of the co-authors are, are right here, so that's a pleasure to, uh, to share this meeting with you today. Um, some of the uh, insights that we've gained from these evolutionary analyses focus on transcriptional regulation and metabolism. 
And in trying to ponder the question of what do the signatures of selection mean, um, I will take you through some work that's of more of a mechanistic nature uh, in honeybees, dealing with transcriptional regulatory network rewiring and um, connections between brain metabolism and aggression, and then finish up with a more evolutionary perspective uh, using the genetic toolkit concept. So um, I've annotated this outline, so you see some of the key players, some of the key grants um, that were involved. Uh, so I mentioned the, uh, the paper, the 10B paper, that was a really giant uh, collaborative effort among a number of individuals spearheaded by Karen Kapheim, who is here, just came from the field to join us for this meeting. Uh, the Brain Transcriptional Regulatory Network analysis is based on a large number of studies, which I'll mention, uh, that was under the auspices of a large grant from NSF, a fiber grant. Bruce Schatz was the PI of this grant, and Adam Hamilton, a graduate student in the lab, is spearheading the more current work. Uh, the brain metabolism and aggression work grew out of some of the B-space insights. Uh, then we've been collaborating with the laboratory of Nathan Price at the Institute for Systems Biology, and the research is spearhead by, spearheaded by Claire Richoff, who's a postdoc in Christina's lab and my lab working jointly, and so we'll hear about that. And then finally, the genetic toolkit work is uh, under the auspices of a Simons Foundation grant in, a, in an interdisciplinary research team that my laboratory is part of at the Institute for Genomic Biology, and the work is being spearheaded again by Claire and another postdoc, Michael Saul. So let's go into then the first part of the talk. Um, the 10B species analysis, this was uh, a very careful selection of 10 species of honeybees, uh, excuse me, I'll try to say bees uh, as much as I can. Um, 10 species of bees that were carefully chosen uh, for along a couple of axes, one to kind of go up the social ladder, as you can see on the top left, uh, different categories of eusociality, and then also uh, diverse from the phylogenetic perspective, we included two families which uh, feature eusociality, helictids and the apids, and then also a megachylid, solitary bee. Uh, on the right, you see um, gorgeous uh, figures that depict uh, a little bit some of the nests. Those numbers there are in logarithmic terms, the size of the nest, just to give generalists a feel for the range in the size of the social unit from one up to ten to the four. And uh, the numbers that you see on this uh, phylogeny represent different evolutions of eusociality. So we wanted to be able to look at different levels of eusociality, uh, independent evolutions of eusociality, and, um, and try to draw some inferences using tools of uh, molecular evolution. So uh, it's a very rich study. There's a lot there. I'm just going to highlight a couple of points um, tonight, and they're indicated here. Um, what we found is an increased capacity for transcriptional regulation. Uh, we found evidence for positive, negative, and neutral selection. We found very little uh, evidence of convergence at the gene level, but a fair amount of convergence at higher levels of organization. And then, um, as we have seen in a variety of contexts, in which I will mention along the way, uh, metabolic genes showing prominent signatures of selection. So let's talk first a little bit about the transcriptional piece. And in doing so, it's a pleasure to be able to do this um, in the presence of Saurabh Sinha, who will be speaking later. Saurabh's lab is part of the thematic group uh, at the IGB. We worked together for, for years, and his lab has spearheaded um, this work. We've been working together almost 10 years on a vision to try to crack a cis regulatory code for social behavior. And um, Saurabh's a brilliant computer scientist. It's been a pleasure to work with him, and you're going to really enjoy his talk. And for now, you can enjoy the fruits of the analyses that were done in his laboratory. So um, I want to show you a couple of uh, figures that make a few points. The, one, the figure on the left is a heat map. It shows our species on the x-axis going up in social complexity. And then the heat map, the dark blue is strong, and then the lighter colors are weak. Um, analyses that were done to infer the presence of a transcription factor binding sites within the promoter regions of the genes, and the word presence is a poetic word, um, and it's meant to combine um, various measures of binding site strength, frequency, or inferred binding site strength, I should say, frequency of occurrence, to overall give us a gestalt for the, the concept of the strength of the transcription factor and the, uh, and the degrees of freedom, if you will, that it may have in regulating a particular gene. 
So uh, there were 189 distinct cis motifs uh, whose transcription factors were fairly well conserved across these 10 species. Then we used a group of ortho genes that were conserved uh, that had at least one representative ortholog from each of the 10 species. That number took us to about 7,204 genes. And so the rows represent the motif gene pairs. Uh, there were 1.4 possible motif gene pair combinations, if you multiply the two numbers that I just gave you, 189 by 7,204. And then what we found then was that about 405,000 of these show, uh, are present with uh, strong motif presence. Um, and that number, when you actually then take that down and look at the number of significant motif gene correlations, there were 21, about 2,100. If you do the analysis by chance alone, you'll get 480. So many more than chance alone show a significant correlation, the presence of the motif with the gene. And then what we saw basically in very simple terms is that there was an increase in the presence of these mo motifs as you increase in sociality. Greater capacity for regulation by a particular transcription factor. The easiest way to envision it is more transcription factor binding sites for a given gene in a promoter as you go across the 10 species. You can also uh, look at a few of them. These are indicated on the top right. Uh, some of them are well known. USP, for example, is one involved in a variety of, uh, of physiological regulation in insects, especially in the juvenile hormone pathway. Uh, CREB is involved in neuroplasticity across organisms. So there are some old familiar faces uh, there. Um, what the point of the top right, though, is if you look at the hatches and the solid bars, you see an interesting um, situation. And that is that many of the genes for which we see this movement, if you will, this evolutionary dynamism in the number of transcription factor binding sites, the presence of the binding sites, the genes themselves, the coding regions, show constrained evolution. So the hatches uh, are negative evolution and the solid bars positive evolution. And so we see this very uh, interesting contrast, which actually has been seen. Uh, laboratory of Amro Zayed, the figure on the bottom right, uh, has provided evidence for constraints on coding region evolution, but not on the regulatory regions, using some of the transcription factors and genes in a brain transcriptional regulatory network, which I'll be showing you uh, in a little while. Amro's lab took a look at that and came up with a, with a conclusion that's actually quite similar to, uh, to what we're seeing. Another element of this increased uh, transcriptional capacity, regulation capacity, is uh, an analysis that was done uh, as part of the 10B project by Mike Goodisman and colleagues, several of them here also tonight. And again, uh, you can look at social complexity and array it along the x-axis, increasing uh, the arrow to the right. And uh, what Mike and his colleagues found is that there's an increase in the amount of predicted uh, methylated genes as you increase in sociality. Uh, we were intrigued by these two findings and together with, uh, with these two findings came up with this idea of increased transcriptional capacity or regulatory capacity for genes associated with an increase in sociality. Another element of the genomic signatures um, you can see here. Um, and so just focus for a second on that big zero right smack in the middle. So that supports the point that when you look at the genes that show signatures of selection, uh, we found very few, and in case when you actually overlap all of them, very, uh, a zero in terms of the number of overlapping genes showing signatures of selection across, say, the two families, apids and helictids, um, and so on and so forth. Um, a mixture, as I said, of genes under positive selection and genes under negative selection. So this, uh, this was uh, another pattern that we saw. Looking at, it, at results from another paper on molecular evolution of, of bees, in this case, uh, a slightly different uh, collection of bees. This was published a few years ago. Uh, Woodard Fishman et al. from my laboratory in collaboration with several others, focusing just on transcriptome data, so coding region data. Um, we did get a strong signal uh, of metabolic genes showing selection, uh, positive selection. Um, and in this case, there was some convergence uh, 
uh, evidence for convergence. So a number of the similar genes. This, is partic this particular pathway is the glycolysis pathway. So I wanted to share these with you. They set the stage for the next parts of the talk. But in leaving this part of the talk, I want to note a few things. First of all, that uh, uh, a group that uh, published a paper in genome research uh, last year, uh, we, Jürgen Gadow and, and many others, several others that are here, um, noted something similar about that I think one could say an increase in regulatory capacity um, associated with eusocial evolution um, in ants. And so that's a very interesting parallel. I can also say that um, now that we have this information, this rich body of information, um, now focusing back on the bees, on the different signatures of selection, the different evolutionary changes in regulatory capacity, I think the stage is now set to really start to put together uh, evolutionary theories about the evolution of eusociality. And one important point that came out of uh, our analyses is that it's quite clear that there can be multiple routes to the evolution of eusociality. Multiple biological processes can be engaged in different instantiations of the evolution of eusociality. So we're ready to develop um, what I call it's a wonderful life um, scenarios. That's, uh, of course, uh, uh, a uh, title of a book by Stephen Jay Gould who uh, stole it, or I guess we could say exapted it from the famous Jimmy Stewart movie, which I personally watch every December um, um, now that I have connected to science. It even counts as work time for my, um, for, for my own personal situation. But it's, uh, it's a situation, it's a, it's a book, it's a story. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould made the point that you can have contingency, you can have multiple um, factors entering in, and you can have multiple routes to a particular phenotype. I think that's the situation we have. And so I think the stage is set to put together the rich body of theory, uh, various forms of selection, theories on this, and put this together with uh, the insights that we've gained about the different biological processes that are engaged in the evolution of eusociality, and start to put together some very comprehensive uh, theories about this. And then finally, in transitioning to the next part of the talk, so we have this increase in regulatory capacity. There's evidence of uh, increased uh, transcriptional regulation, increased number of transcriptional factor binding sites. As I said, um, we have this evidence that metabolism is involved, strong signals, uh, genes showing signatures of selection related to metabolism now in two separate studies. So what's the meaning of these? How do they get engaged? How are they part of the evolution of eusociality? So for that, uh, we don't know the answer to that, but let's see what we know about these processes in some uh, other context. So I want to talk about now the rewiring uh, studies that we've done with, brain, with the brain transcriptional regulatory network. So this image that you see here is an image uh, based on a brain transcriptional regulatory network. The analyses were spearheaded by Sriram Chandrasekharan, uh, who was uh, at the time a graduate student in the laboratory of Nathan Price. Uh, at the Institute for Systems Biology. It was based on the B-space uh, studies that I mentioned to you before. Uh, I just want to give you a sense of the scope of those studies. Um, it involved a set of interlocking uh, analyses, transcriptomic analyses, with our second generation microarray that explored various experiments uh, related to foraging, or behavioral maturation, which underlies the division of labor, that, uh, that bees, when they're young, they work in the hive, and then when they're older, they graduate and become foragers. That's what I mean by behavioral maturation. So foraging, behavioral maturation, and aggression. Large number of studies that totaled uh, altogether 853 individual brain profiles or brain region profiles, 48 different behavioral states within these three buckets of foraging, maturation, and aggression. And so uh, Sriram led the effort to model a brain transcriptional regulatory network out of the about 10,000 genes that were present uh, on the second generation microarray. About 25% of them could be modeled according to a very simple pattern, which is that, um, the, so the way this uh, network was made was uh, you do a giant correlation matrix, so 48 behavioral states, 853 individuals, you have gene expression profiles there, and then you correlate the gene expression, the genes that show high levels of correlation, 
um, and the, high, the, the threshold was a correlation of 0.8 or better. You cluster those genes together. You don't call them a cluster yet, though. They're just a group. Then you look at the transcription factors. We had about 180 or so transcription factors. Find the expression pattern of the transcription factor that, most, that was most similar or most predictive of uh, one of these sets of genes, and again, above a high level threshold. And then you marry the transcription factor with the group of genes. Now you have a cluster. Then the clusters are put together hierarchically, and you get this uh, depiction. There were two key points uh, that came out of this analysis. One, there were a set of genes that we call global uh, transcription factors. They're indicated on the top there. Um, that were predicted to regulate gene expression in at least one experiment across all three buckets. So we call these global regulators. They were predictive of gene expression in three distinct behavioral uh, categories. Then there were others that were uh, more context dependent. That is, a particular transcription factor, such as BROAD or FTZF1, showed a behavior specific pattern. They predicted gene expression in one behavioral context, say foraging, but not in another, say aggression. So we've chosen to examine these, and this is the dissertation work of Adam Hamilton, focusing on a transcription factor that is context dependent, and that's FTZF1, and then a transcription factor that's global, and that is broad. We picked those two because they have a known pedigree of endocrine signaling, and as many of you know, juvenile hormone figures prominently in regulating behavior in social insects, uh, and, and a lot of the work uh, is done in honeybees. And so uh, we have a context then for both of these, and then they're related to each other. Broad regulates the, the expression of FTZF1 based on the predictions of this network model and also empirical work done in other species. So um, there were a number of transcription factors that could have been picked. As I said, uh, Broad and FTZF1 were chosen. Um, this is just some of the housekeeping information, number of categories, geo categories that the genes that are targets represent. But the main point is to, uh, is to highlight the fact that based on their position in the network, one being global, one being context dependent, uh, we could make the prediction that manipulating the expression of those transcription factors using uh, RNAi would lead to divergent results. For broad, we expected, we predicted that it would affect uh, behavior in both aggression and foraging, excuse me, aggression and maturation. And for FTZF1, we predicted an effect on maturation, but not aggression. So those are, I'm now going to show you the results of, of Adam's studies that bear on this question. So Adam has uh, performed heroic experiments, uh, injecting uh, hundreds of bees with RNAi. And this is the, this is the setup. And then um, the results are seen here. Uh, predicted effects were obtained for aggression, so broad. RNAi did affect aggression, so this was a laboratory assay that was first developed in the laboratory of Michael Breed about 30 years ago, and Claire Richoff has, has uh, modified it and has it working extremely well for molecular analyses. And uh, so you see here that FTZF1, that the broad RNAi knockdown, excuse me, causes a change in aggression, decreases aggression. And the, uh, F oh, there's a typo in the uh, legend, excuse me. So the pink bar there should be uh, broad rather than FTZF1 on the left. And then the FTZF1 knockdown has no effect on aggression as predicted. Looking at behavioral maturation, we used a system, an RFID system that was uh, developed by citizen scientist Paul Tenzer in the laboratory. And uh, he and Claire Lutz uh, and, and uh, Claudia Lutz last year published a paper that, uh, that showed the system and reported some interesting discoveries using the system. Um, you can see here a bee that uh, has two RFID tags on it, a hive that was specially modified um, to allow for this type of, of monitoring. Um, here's uh, what it looks like. There'll be a bee here. There was a bee here. There it is. So when you see that pink light go off, the laser, uh, that's uh, then recording. So it's possible to monitor um, continuously the activity of bees. And so we've uh, traded in sunscreen for RFID tags after all these years. That's very nice. And uh, the knockdown had the predicted effects. We predicted effects on uh, behavioral maturation in knocking down uh, both. And in fact, that's what was seen. Early foraging and early onset of foraging 
was seen using our common single cohort colony uh, paradigm. So you see the onset of foraging after just a couple of days. And so um, the results were as predicted. So this uh, shows context dependent of regulation of behavior by transcription factors. Adam is doing the gene expression analysis right now uh, to test the specific prediction of context dependent regulation of gene expression. That is, the transcription factor acting in the brain of an aggressive bee is predicted to have a different effect on gene expression than that same transcription factor operating in the brain of a forager. And so the initial results are, uh, are supportive of this. So uh, the effects of broad RNAi on gene expression depend, for example, on whether the bee was exposed to an intruder or not, which is consistent with this context-dependent idea. So in leaving this part of the talk, uh, let me just say a couple of things. Uh, the notion of rewiring uh, at, at the molecular basis is a, is a new concept. The re we are, are well aware of the concept of rewiring neural connections. Here we see a different uh, type concept at the molecular level, and um, this could perhaps be a new mechanism for understanding neural and behavioral plasticity. Those of you that are familiar with development know that this already has been shown in development, that networks can rewire in different life stages and under different um, conditions. I also want to point out, kind of hearkening back to the introduction, that it's helpful to have social insects to test this concept because the behavioral state in a social insect is a very exaggerated state. So when we're looking at these honeybees, if they are foragers, they're doing it for days. If you wake a bee up in the middle of the night, just like if I woke you up in the middle of the night, you're a scientist, you're not just doing it for a couple of hours. That's the way it is for bees. A bee is a forager. Many, not all, but many of the regulatory mechanisms you can find whether the bee is foraging or like if it's raining and the bee is not foraging, the bee is in that state. Likewise, a bee engaged in brood care is in that state. So we have, due to social evolution and division of labor, exaggerated these behavioral states, making it much easier to be able to study um, mechanisms underlying behavior and then kind of work our way back to the more fleeting states that last for just a few hours to see what mechanisms hold as we move into a much less uh, fixed kind of context. So the 10B study, as I said, um, brought to the fore issues of metabolic genes showing strong signatures of selection. And as I said, we saw that earlier. So how could metabolism uh, be involved in eusocial behavior? How do we see it acting in a particular context? That's a big question. Uh, I can just offer one uh, answer, and that is we see a strong involvement of plasticity in brain metabolism in the regulation of aggression. So here is a schematic um, from a paper that, uh, that we've just submitted, uh, I think yesterday, according to Claire, um, that uh, reviews the story of brain metabolism and aggression. And the schematic lays things out pretty well. At the whole organism level, work that was done in the 80s by folks such as Robin Moritz, uh, Ed Southwick, and John Harrison, uh, showed that the, at the whole organism level, aroused states are associated with an increase in whole organism metabolism, measured primarily by uh, oxygen or CO2 type uh, apparatus, consumption uh, or production apparatus. However, our bee space analyses on various aggressive contexts in the honeybee, and I'll explain some of those contexts in a moment, showed a different pattern at the brain. Based on gene expression, we saw a decrease in the expression of genes involved in oxidative phosphorylation and an increase in genes, uh, in the expression of genes involved in glycolysis. So if we just focus on the OxFos piece, uh, the exact opposite effect or change is seen in the brain relative to whole organism. And then uh, analyses that have been done uh, in fruit flies spearheaded by former postdoc Hong Mei Bar Lai, Li, uh, and which I'll talk about in a moment, um, show that this effect of OxFos can actually be localized to neurons rather than glia. This is based on results in Drosophila that I'll show you. So that's an overview. So uh, what, how this work started, and let me just backtrack um, to say that aggression in honeybees and aggression in social insects uh, provides a rich context for these analyses because let's just take the honeybee case. For example, um, honeybees 
because of the success of their foraging, they have developed a vulnerability. So honeybees, as you know, feed on flowers. They collect nectar, tiny amounts of nectar from each flower. They rely on the collective activities of tens of thousands of individuals to collect small amounts of dilute uh, sugary solution called nectar. They then concentrate it. They turn it into honey and um, create a very attractive resource. So I ask you, if you're Winnie the Pooh and you have a sweet tooth, what would you rather do? Collect nectar in microliter amounts at about 40% sugar solution or slap open a beehive where you might have 100 pounds of 85% sugar. So that vulnerability has led to the evolution of a very rich uh, defensive system that involves uh, genetic variation. So think of African bees versus European bees. That involves social roles. Think of guard bees that patrol the entrance, soldiers that are the first bees to go out and, uh, and attack. And that involves communication via alarm pheromones. So that gives us a rich context to explore the molecular basis of aggression and made it possible to, uh, to make the discovery about the role of brain metabolism. So here are the, some of the, uh, so we had the uh, brain gene expression results. Um, we saw a decrease in gene expression uh, for genes associated with oxidative phosphorylation. It was opposite what we saw or what others have reported in uh, whole organism, as I said. So the first thing we wanted to do was ask, does the brain gene expression uh, result actually predict protein? So in collaboration with Julie George's lab, who was then at the University of Illinois, uh, we measured enzyme activity in brain mitochondrial preps in the specific subset of pathways uh, in the oxidative phosphorylation system that we would uh, expect to see the changes, complex one, complex four, and complex five. And as you can see, uh, just as we saw a decrease in gene expression, I didn't show you those results, I told you those results, we see a decrease in mitochondrial activity uh, when we compare alarm pheromone treated bees versus control, when we compare old bees versus young, and when we compare African honeybees to European honeybees. These three comparisons represent three different time scales over which we can study aggression in honeybees. An acute time scale, the exposure of alarm pheromone. A developmental or maturational time scale, bees get more aggressive as they get older. And then an evolutionary time scale, African honeybees versus European honeybees. I dwell on this to say that it's an extremely robust result. Uh, that also included a change when we uh, presented alarm pheromone. So it looked like it was something that was quite robust, but to take it a step further, we wanted to actually do explicit treatment experiments. So uh, we did this um, for uh, honeybees as well as for Drosophila. And so uh, Claire did the experiments on honeybees, treated bees with an inhibitor of oxidative phosphorylation and found that it increased aggression. Used actually two different inhibitors. And so you can see there that the control we set at one, using again the laboratory assay that I mentioned with, with the picture that you see there of a small group of bees in addition a laboratory presented with an intruder. And you can see that bees treated with these inhibitors show an increase in aggression. Hong Mei did the same kind of experiment but in flies and we wanted to do this for a couple of reasons. One, to be able to take advantage of the tools in Drosophila genetics to perform a more precise manipulation. This was done with RNAi lines that had uh, this particular gene, ND20, uh, involved in oxidative phosphorylation, knocked down by a genetic means. We could also order lines that had this uh, manipulation performed either in neurons or in glia to more specifically get at neural mechanism. Uh, we also wanted to do this to be able to extend the paradigm, obviously. Drosophila and honeybees separated by about 300 million years of evolution. The context for aggression that flies use is totally different than the context for uh, aggression in honeybees. And uh, in fact, Drosophila use it to, uh, to defend or to try to acquire, I should say, resources. And honeybees, of course, use it just to defend their hive. And again, uh, we saw the same result. So we see a decrease in oxidative phosphorylation, this time by genetic manipulation in Drosophila, uh, leads to an increase in aggression. So what you see here is the increase in aggression seen in the blue bar on the left 
and then the various control lines that need to be in place to be able to evaluate the result. This was the UAS GAL4 system that some of you are familiar with, and then the original parental line. You'll notice the panel on the bottom. There's no effect in glia, as I said. This is curious because the glia are thought to be the, the neurons that provide a lot of the metabolism, metabolic substrates, and metabolic activity in brains and provide this to neurons. We see the effect in neurons and not um, in glia, leading to a variety of questions. So we have um, some big questions here. Um, what's with the brain-body relationship? Why do we see uh, oxidative phosphorylation going up in the whole body as it goes down in the brain? And we've developed a number of interesting speculations that lead to the second, which I won't go into, but happy to talk about question period. Um, but they lead uh, to this other question about brains in general, and, uh, and that is as we were trying to contextualize the results and think of scenarios, uh, um, that we might develop and hypotheses that we might frame for this, um, we kept coming up against the notion that really in neuroscience it's not clear what the currency of the brain is. Is the brain, uh, is the correct currency ATP the way it is in a muscle cell? If we found these results in muscle cells, it would be much easier to speculate about them because muscles are all about ATP. That's, that's clear. But for the brain, is it ATP or is it neurotransmitters? Some metabolomic work that we did uh, together with uh, Nathan's lab and a, and a colleague uh, at the University of Washington, whose name I'm forgetting right now, um, pointed out that we found uh, cases where there were actual changes in neurotransmitter abundance, specifically glutamate and, uh, and GABA ratios in the aggressive brain are different than in the non-aggressive brain. Is that the source that we should be looking at? Is that the focus that we should have? Or is it the change in ATP? Um, the oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis shift is actually a shift from a more efficient but slower production of ATP, uh, that's oxidative phosphorylation, to a faster but less efficient uh, production of ATP, that's glycolysis. Should we understand it in terms of ATP or a neurotransmitter? We don't know. So these are questions uh, as we go forward. Last part of the talk deals uh, again with a more evolutionary question and it uh, takes us to cross-species analyses that go outside of the social insects and deals with this concept of toolkits for social responsiveness. Um, and it actually figures in with the themes uh, earlier talked about, transcriptional regulation and metabolism. So if extreme society is rare, as we see here, um, that's fair enough to say, but I think it's also possible to easily say that social responsiveness is quite common. So organisms that live in various kinds of, of incidental or very involved societies have some measure of social responsiveness, some measure of responding uh, in precise ways to nuanced behaviors, communication signals from conspecifics. So that's quite common. If that's the case, then we have an interesting situation. That depiction on the left is uh, a marine flatworm thought to be the last common ancestor of vertebrates and invertebrates, lived, such, lived some 600 million years ago. Very rudimentary nervous system, no brain, very distributed uh, nervous system. As far as we know, no social life. We could be wrong, but as far as we know. So raising some interesting questions here, uh, meaning that the social responsiveness that we see in distantly related organisms, it's reasonable to assume evolved independently. And that some of the properties that look similar are, have evolved uh, convergently then based on this scenario here. So we do see a wide variety of examples of social responsiveness in a wide variety of organisms. And if we argue that these are uh, the, process, the product of convergent evolution, how do we best understand the underlying molecular basis? Going to development again, development has given us uh, a new concept where we don't always have to frame things as is it conserved or is it convergent evolution. Uh, we now have the notion of the toolkit. And so that allowed us to frame the question, do brain responses to social evolution involve evolutionary conserved mechanisms? Even if the behavior 
evolved via convergent evolution? Did it make use of common molecular substrates that are used uh, repeatedly? So that's what I like to call the Ghostbuster scenario. And I realize many of you haven't seen uh, Ghostbuster, but I'm really thrilled there's a Ghostbusters 2 coming out this summer. So my joke will once again be uh, a contemporary. So we have this uh, scenario here where we have the social cues, we have the brain, and then we have behavior. Uh, we have a cross-species analysis. This was done in the Gene Network and Neural Developmental Plasticity theme, GNDP theme, at the IGB. Here's the group of scientists that are involved, Allison Bell, and um, here, Lisa Stubbs here, Yoshi Ono, physicist, Jian Ma, computational biologist. You'll be seeing Saurabh just a little while from now. Um, that are working together to study the molecular roots of the social brain. And uh, for those of you not so familiar with the uh, analogy I was making to development, the classic example is the PAC-6 gene, uh, where we have the eye, an image-forming structure that uh, all neuroanatomists are uh, comfortable saying evolved convergently in invertebrates and vertebrates. That seemed to be fine, but no one told PAC-6 because you could take you can take uh, a, the PAC-6 from a mouse into a mutant uh, blind fly and get the development of a normal fly eye and vice versa uh, into a mouse. And so we are asking then, are there toolkits for social behavior in this, uh, in this spirit? Uh, key conserved uh, regulators of social response. So the challenge uh, was for us as experimenters was to come up with a behavioral paradigm that reasonably scales across very disparately related organisms, um, but still maintains fidelity to the particular species. So we came up uh, first with a social challenge paradigm. And uh, in Allison's lab, there was a territory intrusion in an aquarium to look at this in stickleback fish. In Lisa's lab, um, a unfamiliar male going into a cage with another male, a resident male, so a classic uh, resident male paradigm in rodents. And then in honeybees, we used the intruder paradigm that I showed you um, before. Uh, for this initial experiment, uh, we've looked at brain regions in the stickleback and in the mouse based on uh, known literature of responsiveness to social stimuli. In the honeybee, this was the first pass on this. We decided to be conservative and go with the whole brain. Most of the bee space experiments uh, gave us very strong and coherent signals at the whole brain level, so we thought that that was a reasonable place to start. I'll show you a second experiment as part of this, uh, part, of this part of the talk that uh, moves us to the mushroom bodies. But for now, this was a whole brain analysis. And then here are the uh, results of some of the analyses that Claire performed. Uh, we did see common responses at the level of genes, so that the intersecting number 118 in the center represents genes that were differentially expressed as a result of exposure to intruder uh, in the mouse, stickleback, and B paradigms. Using gene ontology to look at some of the uh, enriched processes, uh, we saw transcription factor activity coming up um, prominently, as well as a few others. Here are some of the transcription factors. Several of them have homeobox domains. We were surprised uh, um, and delighted by this. Our code word for the name of this project is homeobox genes for social behavior, again drawing on the beautiful work in development. And so we were kind of stunned to see homeobox genes um, turning up. Looking a little uh, more deeply, um, we see these are clusters of gene ontology categories and using a heat map showing um, the strength of the, uh, of the connections there. Um, again, we saw a decrease in oxidative phosphorylation. That should be familiar to you now. Um, we see evidence for changes in transcription factors, so transcriptional regulation. That should be familiar to you by now, and uh, as well as a few, a few others. Got a couple of interesting surprises as well. Um, so these were some transcription factors that are known to be involved in neurogenesis in uh, both Drosophila and mouse. Uh, they have no known functions in the adult brain, but we find them expressed. These are images from the ventral medial hypothalamus, hypothalamus in mouse. Um, we see them uh, expressed uh, very robustly in overlapping VMH populations and leading to a very, these are three of the transcription factors. 
uh, leading to the interesting idea of are we seeing some repurposing of these uh, transcription factors that are known to be involved in neurogenesis um, involved in adult uh, behavioral plasticity. And uh, it always kind of galls me to have to say repurposing. Um, development went molecular about 25 years before behavior did, so they got to call them developmental genes. But uh, if we had got there first, then they'd have to be sitting, standing here right now saying, huh, repurposing of adult plasticity genes. But we have to deal with what we, where we are. Uh, Michael Saul has taken the analyses further. And uh, this is now the second experiment where we've added uh, a couple of key pieces, the main piece being time points, three different time points, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and 120 minutes after the intruder. And you can see rich changes, rich patterns of change in various parts of the brain. These are data from mouse, um, and this is a WGCNA analysis which is similar to the transcriptional regulatory network analysis that I spoke about before. Uh, here are two modules that are, that are related that show very interesting patterns, uh, a brain region by intruder status, by time point uh, interaction. So these we are focusing on as of particular um, interest because they're in play in the context of the, the response to the intruder and over time, and they vary by brain region. Um, again, uh, one, re one of these clusters is enriched for oxidative phosphorylation. The other is enriched for zinc finger nucleases that uh, zinc finger nucleo uh, transcription factors and transcription and chromatin structure. So again, plasticity or changes in transcriptional regulation seem to be um, quite obvious here. This experiment I'm not showing you, but also showed very robust overlap across the three species in some of the same categories and even some of the same genes as we saw in the, in the previous work. Where we're going with this is to pair this with another paradigm that we're just finishing um, doing the analysis on, sort of the reverse, and that's the social opportunity paradigm. There it was harder to find um, behavioral contexts that scale reasonably across the three species with such diverse uh, lifestyles. Um, but we have something that uh, works, uh, and that's care behavior. And um, we're starting to analyze those results. And the preliminary results are there, again, is some overlap uh, across the three species. What we're also interested is to see whether it's the same genes that are involved in the response to social challenge. Ideally, we'd like to be able to find genes that are responding to change, social change, in which case we'd see them in both contexts. But we'd also love to see some that might be labeling the context more specifically, the polarity, good or bad, um, as the case may be. But we don't know the answer uh, to that yet. In thinking about these results more broadly, I mentioned the time points, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 120, social challenge. The animals are responding immediately to the social challenge, as you expect they would. Case of the honeybees, they're responding, they're stinging, um, their lives depend on it, or the lives of the colony depend on mounting a rapid response. It raises the question of, well, what are these changes that go on 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and 120 minutes? What do they have to do with the behavior that was performed um, so much earlier? And I think that's a big question. Um, the brain has two control systems, the neural system and the molecular. And we know very little about how closely they're related, how they interact. Um, why, for example, should there be such exquisite connection, correspondence between changes in RNA levels and changes in behavior? As this uh, figure makes very clear, there's uh, a lot of space between RNA abundance and behavior many places for neuroplasticity to take place, which, and that it's known that neuroplasticity takes place. Why do we see changes in RNA abundance all the way back here, um, so tightly connected with behavior, and then experiments and honeybees and other species um, showing actually causal relationships between changes in gene expression and change in behavior? Um, I think one answer is revealed in the honeybee results. Um, and that is the immediate response to the intruder is a neural response. It happens, I mean, I can say this easily because it happens quicker than transcriptional change can occur just on the basis of first kinetic principles. So we have this change that goes on. 
what's the molecular change about? Well, an experiment performed by Cedric Alou, a former postdoc in the lab, who's now an independent scientist at INRA in Avignon, France, uh, measured the response to alarm pheromone exposure over time. And what Cedric found is that there's an increase in the responsiveness for the first 90 minutes after an intruder exposure. So when you re do this over time, you see this uh, sensitization or increase in responsiveness. This tracks the molecular changes. We have yet to show that there's a causal relationship, but it certainly tracks this. As an aside, Cedric uh, has confirmed what beekeepers have known for hundreds of years. If you disturb a colony, you should stay away from that colony for a period of time. But it's nice to actually see this under experimental uh, conditions. So taking the work uh, in another direction, uh, we see this now in a variety of animal species, responsiveness to social conditions. We see the beginnings of common responses, a toolkit. And so this has emboldened us to ask whether we can also see this in the human context uh, right here. This is an image that I uh, enjoy showing. It's uh, football fans from the University of Illinois tearing down the goalposts uh, because they went to the Rose Bowl that year. It doesn't happen very often in Illinois. Um, actually, uh, uh, a year that we're more proud of, uh, many of us, is the year 2003 when w the University of Illinois won more Nobel Prizes than football games. So <laughs> that was, that's the kind of thing that we're happy about. But this, this is a, a better image for what I'm talking about, the idea that humans, of course, respond to a variety of social uh, conditions. And in, in trying to apply this, I want to, first of all, make very clear that we're not talking, uh, for example, about bees as little humans or humans as big bees. We're talking, in applying the toolkit concept, we're talking about common building blocks that then can get used in a variety of ways. This is incredibly important as we try to, to take a translational sociogenomics approach and, and start to integrate this work uh, at the level of humans. Um, the last time this was tried in the 70s, it failed miserably. We didn't understand the molecular basis, and uh, the approaches, well-meaning, uh, led to a lot of polarization, and in fact led to social sciences throwing out the baby with the bathwater. They didn't like the deterministic model that biologists had for the relationship between genes and behavior, so they concluded that, bi that biology wasn't necessary to understand behavior. And that's uh, changing now, but has been in effect for some time, such that if you look at the curricula of uh, social science students who study behavior, they are not required to study anything in biology. So this is starting to change, especially thanks to findings of the dynamic genome, how the environment affects the genome, one of the real fruits of, of early fruits of genomics, and, um, and now with epigenetics providing a clear-cut mechanism for how to visualize that and conceptualize that. But in moving there, I think it's important to just remind folks that this is uh, the concept that we're talking about, which is the toolkit concept, the building block concept. So as part of our IGB theme, um, we have a group of social scientists and biologists uh, led by Ruby Mendenhall, who's a sociologist uh, who has studied for many years uh, single moms in South Chicago. So Ruby Mendenhall on the left, Brent Roberts, a psychologist, a uh, student of Ruby's, and uh, Sandra rodriguez Zaz, a statistical geneticist. Here's Claire. Um, and the idea is to apply this paradigm to study stress and resiliency in South Chicago, which experiences very high levels of uh, violence and, uh, lots and high levels of stress as a result of this. So one limitation of moving into humans is that we're not able to study brain gene expression in a dynamic sense. Um, so the approaches right now in humans are limited either to autopsy samples, which doesn't help us for a study uh, like this, or blood samples. There have been some um, very intriguing uh, early successes with correlating changes in uh, gene expression in leukocytes um, with levels of stress in humans. Some of the uh, first work was done by Steve Cole at UCLA, and so we are using um, this approach. We also are um, kind of uh, taking a wacky approach and trying to see if we can develop uh, a machine that images gene expression uh, non-invasively, taking advantage. So the MRI technique uh, was invented by Paul Lauterbauer, who was at Illinois, won one of those Nobel Prizes that I just mentioned that year for that. And so we have uh, started working with some uh, imaging, electrical, computer engineering folks uh, to see if we can't 
do something to image gene expression. This would then really break open um, this field. So um, in thinking about this part of the talk and, and moving to closing it up, um, we saw transcriptional regulation and metabolism again in our toolkits. Uh, raises a question of how many toolkits are there? What level of granularity should we, would, should we be applying the toolkit uh, concept? Um, that's an important question. And then I also want to say that certainly from the perspective of animal behavior, we're not just interested in the similarities, but also the differences. These species are wildly different, of course. They have a different evolutionary history. They live in different parts of the uh, phylogenetic tree. And uh, we're interested in what makes uh, a bee a bee and a stickleback a stickleback. Some of those seeds for that could be in these analyses as well. So uh, to conclude, um, we have the beginnings of a cis-regulatory code for social behavior. <coughs> evidenced in a variety of ways that, uh, that I've tried to mention tonight. Meta metabolic pathways seem to be coming up. They are what I would say surprising players in molecular regulation of social behavior. When we got our first gene lists on our first microarrays, we saw these metabolic genes. All of you have seen these metabolic genes. We ignored them because they're not sexy. They're not the neurotransmitter genes, the ion receptor genes, and so on and so forth. Um, we started paying attention to them, and they have led us in very interesting ways. Um, as we go forward in the field, I think there are a couple of issues that we need to think about. Validation in the systems biology era is a real challenge. So the Brain Transcriptional Regulatory Network has provided tens if not hundreds of results. If you're a hardcore systems biologist, tens if not hundreds of hypotheses. If you're a hardcore empirical biologist, and uh, I'm somewhere in between, and a challenge. Um, so Adam, a uh, graduate student uh, doing a superb job in his PhD, is working with two transcription factors out of the 180 that we could be studying there. So that ratio of uh, hypotheses generated or, or interesting results generated from a systems biology analysis and how to uh, validate it or, or explicate it um, in the laboratory context, there's a big mismatch. We need better methods of, of validation in the systems biology uh, era. Um, translational sociogenomics, I think, has a lot of potential. I just want to give a shout out to the recent work of Andy Barron, uh, who used uh, the behavioral maturation paradigm and precocious foraging, which uh, has been studied in a number of labs. A plasticity and division of labor was first noted in the early 1900s. Uh, used that paradigm to make, I think, the most substantial contribution to our understanding of colony collapse disorder yet. And so as we, and, and stage is set to actually provide a molecular analysis to the behavioral uh, work that, uh, that he did. And as we get more insights about genes and processes and what they're doing, um, there is the opportunity to apply them, whether it's in a human context, whether it's in applied context um, in social insects uh, as well. And then um, kind of to sort of go back to that first point, genomics needs phenomics. And so I wanted to end uh, my lecture tonight by just showing you a little teaser on uh, one of our contributions to phenomics, and that's the work of Tim Gernot, who is a computer science graduate student um, working in my laboratory. Tim is creating a Facebook for bees, bee social network, um, using 24-7 uh, monitoring of barcoded bees. Um, this work, uh, some of this work in ants has already, you've, we've already seen this from Laurent Keller's uh, lab focusing on um, this kind of continuous monitoring to get insights into division of labor. What Tim is doing is using this continuous monitoring to get insights into social network. So what Tim has done is uh, designed a system using machine vision and machine learning. He designed the barcodes. Here they are here. They have position information, individual identity information, the camera. That, that picture that you just saw, a very, very expensive camera, um, runs all the time generating images 24-7. Uh, and um, genomic data is big, as Saurabh would agree and Mike Schatz would agree, but we've got some big B image data um, as well um, on these in this experiment here. Um, so images of the colony, every bee has a barcode on it. That these are special small colonies of about 1,000 bees. And uh, one program of Tim's can recognize uh, over 95% of the bees in every single image. And then, um, then another program uh, will take a look at bees, look for bees that have uh, a characteristic posture. They are 
They're, as you can see right here, head to head. Their tongue is out, their antennae are touching. We know from prior information this is social uh, transfer of food known as trophallaxis in the social insect literature. There are a variety of forms of information flow that have been documented uh, to occur in the context of trophallaxis in ants and bees and termites. And uh, so Tim is able to identify two bees engaged in trophallaxis. That's another um, program and then call that a social interaction and then create either time aggregated networks or just a simple aggregated network uh, over the whole week and create pictures like this. And I'll just give you a taste of some of these results. Um, so this emphasizes inter-individual variation. First of all, the queen has the most interaction partners and the greatest number of interactions after one week. That's good. We know that that makes sense because the queen attracts individuals. Um, then we also see that uh, there's great inter-individual variation with uh, some bees having 553 interactions and then this other bee having just a couple of dozen. So we don't know the functional implications of these two groups of bees. Are the bees that are well connected bees that are aware of all the colony needs and they are responsive to everything or are they bees that are so busy yapping um, with each other that they're oblivious to colony needs. Likewise, we don't know about this lonely bee. Is it on the periphery of society um, and not contributing? Or is it one of those bees that's thinking the next great thought about where the next food source is? Um, so we want to connect functional information about performance in the hive with activities with these interaction patterns. With that, I'll close um, with the slide that mentions uh, the, all the people who've worked uh, on the various studies that I talked about, some of the key genomic resources. It's a pleasure that, to welcome Guo Zhi Zhang here from BGI. Um, we've had a productive collaboration, and BGI has done so much to, uh, to develop the genomic uh, prowess of the social insect community. And then all my collaborators uh, listed here, hopefully I managed to, to uh, mention them all. So thank you very much. <laughs>